The time is midnight, April 25th, 1986. A pleasant warm Thursday in the northern region of the Kiev Oblast. And in a little over 25 hours, this scene will be changed forever. Tomorrow, the fourth reactor of the Chernobyl nuclear power plant will explode. Two dying due to the explosion, and another 29 succumbing to radiation-related illnesses. The total number of deaths can only be estimated in the thousands. But how did Chernobyl explode? Let us follow that story along. At this point in time, Chernobyl's fourth reactor is actually stable, producing 3,100 megawatts of thermal output and 930 megawatts of electricity. Currently supervising the operation of the reactor is 32-year-old Alexander Akimov, with three years of experience in the role. The man handling the control of the reactor is 25-year-old Leonid Toptonov, who had held this title for two months, after close to three years of training. To his right is Boris Stolyachuk, a 27-year-old engineer in control of the numerous pumps that supplied water through the reactor, and to his right was Igor Kirshenbaum, controlling the two turbines in Unit 4. These same men would be in charge of the reactor on the morning of April 26th, so remember those names. At 1.06am, the order was given to begin the power reduction for the already overdue scheduled shutdown of the reactor, with multiple tests to be performed, of course. The most important of these for the operators was the scheduled vibration measurements on Unit 4's turbines, 7 and 8, to rebalance the bearings that were causing them to become unstable. To do this, members of the Kharkiv turbine plant had driven their red Mercedes inside the turbine hall to record measurements. Again, they will be present on April 26th, so keep them in mind as well. And so, the power begins to drop, in small steps throughout the night. The reason for this is quite simple. When power is decreased, the rate at which Xenon-135 is burned away by nuclear fission decreases and Xenon-135, as it is commonly known now by many, is the strongest neutron poison known. When you lower the power, both the rate of Xenon removal and production decreases, but it takes time for all that excess Xenon to decay away or be burned off by nuclear fission. To compensate, control rods are then withdrawn. Step by step, the power goes down to 2,350 megawatts at 150, 2,100 megawatts by 255, and to 1,600 megawatts by 347. This is where they should have held it for now, but in fact, Toptonov let it drop slightly too far, and it fell to 1,500 megawatts. So, he brings it back up, raising more control rods to compensate, and by 5am, the reactor is steady at half power. And here we have the first thing we must pay attention to. Xenon. With the power reduction complete, we have started a timer for the Xenon transient. Initially, the concentration is going to rise sharply, but soon after the peak, it will decrease back down to a proportional level. At 5.43, the sun rose on the Chernobyl nuclear power plant, and work began to pick up. Vibration measurements on the turbines, gas cooling experiments on the graphite stack, and the second point worth raising in the long chain of events leading to the explosion. When the operators of the Scala computer performed their scheduled printout of reactor parameters, the operating reactivity margin, the effective number of control rods in the core, read 13.2. Now, as was repeated numerous times throughout the trial, an operating reactivity margin below 15 required an immediate shutdown of the reactor, and Nikolai Fomin, the chief engineer, was actually informed of the low operating reactivity margin, but he told them to carry on. Why? For two reasons. One, the operating reactivity margin was not valued that highly by operators, and those in charge alike. Between that and interrupting all of their experiments, there was little reason for an immediate shutdown when one was planned in a few hours, anyway. And secondly, acknowledged in the operating log, the reactor was not actually below 15 rods. The computer had actually glitched and failed to account for the automatic control rods used to regulate the power and keep it stable, 
which put the true operating reactivity margin at 18. In the end, Toptonov's punishment for this safety violation amounted to little more than an explanatory note, due at the end of his shift on the next day. With the reactor scheduled to be shut down before that shift, he would have plenty of time to write it. At 8 o'clock, the first shift change our video will be covering occurred. Akimov was substituted for Igor Kazachkov, 30 years old, highly experienced, and in charge of an equally experienced team who would be conducting the rundown. Also present was the Deputy Chief Engineer, Anatoly Dyatlov, the external group supervising the rundown, Don Tekanergo, members of the Kharkiv turbine plant conducting their own turbine experiments, and scientists supervising the reactor control. Kazachkov and Dyatlov agreed that the rundown experiment would take place at 2.15 that afternoon, and work was made just for that, with more turbine measurements completed in the meantime, especially on Turbine 7. But they were not the only ones doing unusual work that day. Out at Unit 5, the firefighters for the Chernobyl Nuclear Power Plant, 2nd Paramilitary Fire and Rescue Unit, were undergoing practical exercises, using the reactor building under construction as the best location they could find, simulating driving up to the building, laying hose pipes, advancing to the building. Rare work, for the worst case scenario, but necessary. Back at the nuclear power plant, Don Tekanergo was finalising its preparations, completing electrical work that would set all the equipment onto the reserve batteries. The atmosphere was calm enough for Dyatlov to leave for a long overdue lunch break. And then, at 1.05pm, they disconnected Turbine 7, allowing it to run down. Measurements were complete, and only one turbine was needed for the experiment. Everyone was calm, waiting. One hour later, the first official violation of procedure occurred. The emergency core coolant system was quite simple, forcing pressurised water from external tanks into the steam separators above the reactor and then down into the core in the event of a channel bursting, to cool the channel and prevent a meltdown. The odds of it estimated about as likely as a plane crashing directly on top of you. There were concerns here that having the ECCS active would cause an accidental activation, which would not only be very expensive with all the water forced into the core, it could also damage it through heat stress, with several hundred degrees Celsius zirconium coming into contact with room temperature water. Officially speaking, disabling this was out of regulation, and in the future, Kazachkov and his team would be dragged through the mud by the press, especially in the West for this. However, this was allowed by regulation if the chief engineer signed off on it, and Nikolai Fomin did just that when he put his signature on the rundown. Turning it off was, of course, not as simple as flipping a switch. It took two or three people together to close a single valve, almost the size of a steering wheel of a ship, and there were several valves to be closed. This does also mean they were going to run the experiment with the emergency core coolant system partially active, but that is beside the point. The ECCS came out of operation, and the senior reactor control engineer began to lower the power in preparation for the experiment. And now, problems with the turbines are about to spiral. Vibration measurements on Turbine 7 have been completed, but if we swing across to Turbine 8, the sensors for the vibration measurements were supposed to be connected to brackets welded to the turbine. They had not been welded, and so measurements couldn't be collected on this turbine until the repairs had been done. Now they were complete, Dyatlov and Kazachkov were about to call the chief shift supervisor to start lowering the power ready for the rundown. But fate intervened hundreds of miles away, at another nuclear power plant. The South Ukraine nuclear power plant, to be precise. Here, one of the two reactors unexpectedly encountered an issue and scrammed, taking with it 1000 megawatts of electricity from the grid. Chernobyl Unit 4, outputting roughly 500 megawatts into the grid, was now one of the few vital lifelines stopping a shortage in the system. The grid dispatcher called the nuclear power plant, answered by the chief shift supervisor, who started begging Unit 4 not to disconnect from the grid. 
praying for every single megawatt. The chief shift supervisor, Boris Baranov, called the control room and gave them the order, do not shut down, delay until you have permission. And Kazachkov, Metlenko, Dyatlov and everyone else knew. They were not going to be doing the rundown. Not at that time. So, Dyatlov spoke to Don Tekenergo and told them to return to Pripyat. Shortly thereafter, he too left to get some sleep before the next shift, and Kazachkov was left to prepare Unit 4 for its shutdown on his own. Around this time, our second shift change of the day occurred, and this again means a new team controlling the reactor. Igor Kazachkov has now been replaced by Yuri Tregub. Again, another experienced operator who was once the senior reactor control engineer for Unit 3. He's one of the most experienced operators at the plant, and now he has to handle a reactor that he thought had been shut down two hours ago. His first action was the opposite of this, raising the power back up to 1,600 megawatts. Here, Tregub decided not to restart the emergency core coolant system. While bringing it out of operation was not against procedure, leaving it offline was, as the delay was certainly not part of the rundown. So, ECCS remained offline, with Kazachkov expecting the rundown program to resume around 6pm, within Tregub's shift. Now, despite his experience, Tregub had no idea how the rundown program worked, and spent an hour reading and rereading it all until it made sense to him and even then it left him with plenty of questions. An hour later, he asked the new chief shift supervisor, Gennady Dick, if they had permission for the rundown, as Kazachkov had suggested. They did not. Two hours later, now 8pm, again, Tregub calls Dick, now concerned that Unit 4 had been forgotten about. Again, they didn't have permission to disconnect from the grid, the grid dispatcher had still not found alternative power sources to combat the evening energy demand. But Dick did say that they would need to call Dyatlov before proceeding with the rundown. So, Tregub calls Dyatlov and received no response. Perhaps he was asleep, Tregub thought, so he called again. And this time, Dyatlov did answer. Again, he said wait until he was present in the control room to resume the rundown. Tregub tried to press him for some answers to his questions. Dyatlov's response, this is not a question for the telephone, don't start without me. And then he hung up. Almost as soon as he put the phone down, he received a call from Nikolai Fomin, asking for an update on Unit 4. Tregub told him he had not shut down the reactor, and Fomin again told him to wait until Dyatlov had arrived to do anything with the reactor. 10pm. Tregub was still waiting for an update from Dyatlov. For a third time, he called his apartment. This time, it was Dyatlov's wife, Isabella, who answered. Isabella told him that Dyatlov had already left and he should be there soon. An hour later, Tregub received permission from Dick to lower the power, but Dyatlov was still not there. Where could he be? After calling Unit 3, he got his answer. Dyatlov was there chastising someone for inadequate performance. At least he had an answer now. With that, Tregub gave the order to resume lowering the power, and his reactor engineer, Konstantin Ermakov, did just that. At this point in time, the peak xenon concentration in the reactor had long since passed, and was on its way down. Operating reactivity margin was around 26, a safe level, and, gradually, activity began to pick up in the control room. Akimov was back at the nuclear power plant, and spoke to his counterpart in Unit 3, Yuri Bagdasarov. Then he made his way to Unit 4 to talk to Tregub about the experiment. Power was already at 1200 megawatts and dropping. Now, he spoke to Tregub, who was as concerned about the rundown as he was when he first read it. Too many questions, not enough answers. Finally, Dyatlov arrived, and again Tregub began demanding the answers he desired. Dyatlov told him they would deal with issues as they arrived, and that it wasn't his shift. It wasn't his problem. 
Trego relented, but opted to remain in the control room to help, and to assist just in case things went awry. More and more people arrived. Toptonov, Stoyachuk, Kirschenbaum, Metlenko and others. Briefings were given out on the status of Unit 4, what work needed to be carried out, and their duties for the night. And, at midnight, reactor power down to 760 megawatts, the announcement over the loudspeakers confirmed the shift change, and the fifth shift took control of the reactor again. In 90 minutes, Chernobyl Unit 4 will be destroyed.